The next two entries in this series have given me serious grief, and I think it's worth it to take a step back and talk about why. The subject of one was to be the various problems with words in general and my specific dark night of the soul, which is still going on, touching again on hypergraphia or the irresistible compulsion to write without surcease which eventually becomes like a cycle of scratching bug bites that worsens the desperation and the flood of words gets more intense and emotional and the more I resist, the more violently it persists. The subject of the other was to be about story and for that subject I felt great apathy and pointlessness which reflects where I am with that too. I didn't get this way overnight. It's extremely neurotic and required a lot of external trauma and of course a lot of not merely bad but abusive communication with other people to push me into this state as well as exhaustive self and other blame and years of fruitless studying of communication styles and trying to learn terms and techniques only to find ultimately that the main problem I was encountering was not, as others claimed, merely something I was doing, but mainly with a lack of caring or unwillingness to listen or some other quality on the part of the particular listeners who were giving me grief, as tended to be the failures over which I obsessed over so much that I never even noticed any successes, even in hindsight, things over which I have zero control. If I have succeeded in communicating su successfully, and I think I have, usually thoughtful silence is my reward. And sometimes such gratifying comments, but my brain was wired to respond more to criticism, as is the fate of survivors of prolonged crazy-making child and other abuse. Hey ho. Seeing as how I had dedicated my entire life from the age of two, teaching myself to read and write, and revere and almost worship the word as a form of communication, to swim in metaphor, to wrangle the English language, to do empathy, to adjust myself to the emotional temperature and expectations of those around me in the hope of using that to my advantage in communication, finding that what I had dedicated my whole life to, the only possible power at my disposal that might possibly stop the abuse and pain and defend me against the verbal assaults of my captors and ease my living put me on even footing and finally earn me treatment with respect would never guarantee me those things was devastating to me beyond measure. Gradually I went into an eclipse of silence that nearly killed me. A silence like those Tilly Olson wrote so feelingly in her ironically solo work, a book called Silences, the silence of those who, not who have nothing to say, but to whom no one will listen, respect, or regard as valid. I am not, by any means, the first to come to this point, not by a long shot. From my reading, many, many writers who spend enormous amounts of time at reading and writing, especially specifically into why people do the things they say and do, and noticing the discrepancies we're in, and then asking why. Many, many go off the deep end, and if they ever find some answer, become embittered, jaded if prolific writers and very depressing to read. The best ones manage to leaven the rock hard bread of their writing stuff with humor or a bit of somewhat twisted wonder, striking the right balance with satire or the mythic. 
but many more end up skating the fine line along drugs, insanity, or philosophy, the last of which is pretty much solipsism for white men who can afford the college education and manage the maintenance of the blinkers. I haven't yet met a woman who studies philosophy who doesn't primarily identify as a feminist. My theory is that if you start paying attention to how life works, and you're anything but at the top of the heap, you can't help but notice it's not equal for you. Whereas if you're at the top of the heap, it takes concentrated, constant effort of will and consciousness to be aware of it and continue to be aware of it. Precisely like seeing through a somebody else's problem field in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'll link to an article by Philip Sandifer called Spike and Rape Culture, which gives you a white man's, a white geek's, no less, a white academic geek's words specifically on this effort from his point of view, pointing out that the default is what you're raised with and raised to. So to say I got this idea not from my own brain, but from a white dude, okay? and a pretty spiffy one who seems to have managed to have positive, ongoing, long-term relationships with real in-the-flesh women as part of his credentials. I believe it takes courage for a white man to brutally honestly say what he did, and his article is worth a read for, I think, pretty much anyone. I digress, but as I've said many times pre previously, this is a personal journey an intensely personal one about my experiences with art and soul, things that have gotten so deeply mucked up that when I draw from the will, all I get are buckets of muck like these videos. Making sense of them is like trying to make sense of the internal revenue service tax law updates and just as joyless. Most people who make comments on the internet are people with free time and sufficient emotional inclination. Unfortunately, most people with free time are either down on their luck or have no friends or both. Some are by some stroke of fortune, although few and far between, merely badly damaged and gun shy, but still have their hearts on their sleeves and nurtured goodness in a secret heart greenhouse, albeit very closely guarded, and live hermit-like existences like myself. When we are moved and overcome our terror and memories of past bad experiences of actually reaching out and commenting and having that go very badly for us, we comment. Unfortunately, too many of us are commenting to people who are also gun-shy and hermiting away, like myself, and maybe hiding from comments in general, which I am right now because the majority of people who comment on the internet are bitter, full of unchecked anger and directionless malice and spread it around with large shovels and have lots of free time because they're bitter and full of anger because no one wants to spend time with them and they keep losing things and people in situations they enjoy because of a recursive feedback loop they're now helpless to break. And I'm not saying that I may not also be on the spectrum of these people as well. They've decided to say, screw it and give themselves over to full-time internet bitterness. I've heard that siren call myself. Which is the new massively multiplayer international sport of the information age, where every individual is more or less their own team making up their own rules. Actually, there are no rules, and alliances are never permanent. It's much more likely that people commenting are out to invalidate, unload, project, blow off steam and aggression in the most consequence-free way possible, and there are plenty of oppressed and struggling people for whom the internet is our only hope to be heard and seen, and our only voice against a series of unfair systems where in the past we often perished of silence and disregard and contempt. We're the fish in the barrel, and lots of people 
with just enough privilege to have the free time, but not enough to get everything they want, are wandering around with proverbial guns to take out their dissatisfaction with not having all they want on these barrel fish without much thought about why, just wanting to hurt other people because it alleviates their own hurt, or at least spreads their own hurt around, and contempt and condescension has become their addiction of choice. And again, denial, not really thinking about it, that really just helps fuel the addiction of choice. I have had all the contempt and condescension I can stand! And I have had all the abandonment of supposed allies I can stand as well. I understand that those allies also have lives and cares of their own. But at this point, I can't actually trust anyone anymore. Knowing that life is uncertain and I will never be a priority for anyone ever again. The only one who ever stood by his word and by me, who stood by me no matter what, is dead. He was the best of all people for me. Words still mean a lot for me. It is because of them I survived my childhood. Anything that sustained me in my formative years, in place of real caregivers, is not something I can just detach from. Words still have the power to hit me where my soul lives. Many words from the right agency mean the difference between my basic needs and survival, or not. Words are important. They have devastating limitations and alarming dangers. Words can be used to derail, to deflect, to brainwash, as well I know, to lull, to misdirect, to gaslight, to obscure, to threaten, to intimidate. Words certainly can and do hurt every single day. Words can make funding and lives disappear from the right people. Words not backed up by actions can have serious consequences for people depending on and trusting those words. Words can impede communication better than anything else. There's a lot more to communication than words. They say believe half of what you say and none of what you hear, but we keep talking. As if in the hope that through all this sound and fury we will somehow discern meaning. But what words mean to one person, they mean something totally different to someone with different cultural or traumatic background. Something we all know, but repeatedly forget and overlook whenever we use them. Like, take triggers. New Age terminology is triggering to many, if not most, cult survivors, and I can't say that enough because I am one. And we choose what we say. And I'm sick of people telling me that they can't curb their language out of respect for someone else's feelings and pain, specifically mine. Because if someone holds a gun to your head and says, shut up, you will shut up. So it is a choice. The real thing people are saying is, I don't want to watch what I say to you. I don't want to respect your boundaries or what bothers you or makes you uncomfortable. It's more of a priority to me to say what I want to say than treat your feelings with respect and make an effort to think about what I say before I say it. Which is the same thing when white women particularly make a joke about forcing themselves on me when I state clearly, up front, I don't want to be hugged, don't hug me, that I feel physically violated when people do that to me. My body belongs to me, and my physical boundaries are not a joke. It's not funny to force your body on someone else at your pleasure, making them feel violated. Whether it's a hug or a grope or a rape, regardless of what gender or age either party is, it is never okay to violate someone else's physical boundary or make a joke about it, regardless of your gender or the act, nor how you feel about the act, nor how harmless you think it is. If you are harming someone else's body and it's their body, 
That is what matters. Not your sense of rejection or your hurt feelings. If you can't take no for an answer, it's important to remember that their body is not owed to you. No matter what you feel you want or what gender you are or what the act is or how many other people feel about it, you also aren't owed any explanations from them. And it isn't okay to corner them alone on an empty street and yell at them about how rejected you feel. That's extra threatening and it comes off as more than a little rapey. Words are choices. Too often what we say we don't think about before we say it or even after we say it. Maybe it's a product of a time of fast-paced communication, but we can slow down. And most of all, we can take responsibility for our habitual ways of speaking and their consequences, no matter where we learned them. And responsibility for changing the ones that offend or hurt people that we don't want to offend or hurt, or otherwise deal with the consequences of offending or hurting those people or other consequences that we don't like, like adult human beings that we are, and accept that these people have every right to reject us, even angrily, and say loudly that we were told to stop and we did not. This has gone on too long, that we speak and write without thinking, and that we think words have no power, and we tell each other words have no power, and we have made a mockery of our own speech and made it clear that others have no reason to trust or believe or respect what we have to say. And then by, by necessity, talk even more than is necessary just to get across what would have been simpler had we just been true to our words. For myself, my neurosis and panic of words is definitely a neurotic histamine that I pour them like gasoline on a fire when I flip out totally because I feel like no one is believing me. But far worse is when I go silent. That is when I begin to die of the silence. A recurrence of that silence is why I threw out everything I'd written before about words for this video and wrote down this instead. Except to say this, it goes on the long dark night of the soul that I found of hurting because words no longer danced and spun like a river of stars and truisms and secrets half whispered on the almost invisible razor edge between waking and sleeping slithering through the crack particles of inspiration momentary visions some spinning between Clotho's fingers, drawn into Lachesis' tapestries, trimmed by Atroposis into nice, fat little stories. That's another video. And I'm still going to quote my three favorite bits I unearthed for this video and probably add way too many of my own comments because the two real problems about writing and talking about words for me is one, finding a point, and two, getting myself to stop. In the foreword to The Treasury of the Fantastic, Romanticism to Early 20th Century, Peter S. Beagle, author of The Last Unicorn, wrote, quote, In our time, the word has become lost as much of a millstone to a writer of popular fiction as liberal is to a politician. Editors constantly urge the self-fulfilling necessity of lower and lower common denominators, and one becomes wearily accustomed to going without that other sensuality of language, used with grace and music, with attention, not to show off, but to invite the audience into the author's pleasure in telling a tale exactly as its nature demands it to be told, in deliberating joyously over choosing the right word and not its second cousin." End quote. It was one of those 
Frisian moments for me that electrified my spine, even more so than any story or word in the rest of the 748-page hardcover anthology, which included some of the most classic and well-known tales of the fantastic, like Kubla Khan and Sleepy Hollow and Jabberwocky, a personal longtime favorite, and Mort da Arthur, da Arthur and so on. Because that sentence, more than any of the stories, whispered to a place no one else had ever been in me. A place of both great ecstasy and despair, but shrouded in deep mystery. So many things people have said and written about writing have skidded off the surface of me, like a pebble skimming the surface of a stream without so much as a ripple. People can say all manner of things we can nod sagely at or that sound or even feel superficially true, but don't actually penetrate to the truth of the matter. I think it's because it's more wild and elusive than we're prepared to admit and respect. And like defining art, it's not something we can pin down once and for all. From Margaret Atwood's 1969 novel, The Edible Woman, quote, once I went to the zoo, and there was a cage with a frenzied armadillo in it going around in figure eights, just around and around in the same path. I can still remember the funny metallic sound its feet made on the bottom of the cage. They say all caged animals get that way when they're caged. It's a form of psychosis, and even if you set the animals free, after they go like that, they'll just run around in the same pattern. Words, he said, looking in my direction finally, but with eyes strangely unfocused, as though he was really looking at a point several inches beneath my skin, are beginning to lose their meanings. We're all graduate students in English, all of us. I thought everyone in the whole city was. We're so totally inbred that we never get to see anyone else. End quote. Later, quote, what else can I do? Once you've gone this far, you aren't fit for anything else. Something happens to your mind. You're overqualified, overspecialized. Something happens to your... You're overqualified, overspecialized, and everybody knows it. Nobody in any other game would be crazy enough to hire me. I wouldn't even make a good ditch digger. I'd start tearing apart the sewer, sewer system, trying to pickaxe and unearth all those chthonic symbols, pipes, valves, cloacal conduits. No, no, I'll have to be a slave in the paper mines for all time. I only just recently read this, and so it's in a way disheartening, even though I already knew this to read the conclusions I was already coming to from the mouth of a fictional Canadian printed 11 years before I was born. I knew in my soul that on some level, writers sort of know about this some on some uncomfortable level. And the degree to which we are consciously ruminating on this is the degree to which it drives us insane or into academia, which is insanity with tenure for the handful of people who can both afford it and stand it which I am too disabled and poor to do either of those. When we think of education, we tend to hand wave it as always a good thing, but too much education can drive a mind and soul mad. Just like too much of anything we think of as unfettered good, we will quickly learn the downside of. So it's not like I didn't know that other people had already reached the same conclusions I had. After all, all the evidence I'm following is not new, and the brain I'm using is the same one we've all been using for thousands of years. We like to pride ourselves on all the new things we're inventing, new words and concepts, but when we reduce them, strip them of their veneer and pretensions, they're almost always new versions of old things as are we all, as is everything I'm saying right now. I guess what gets to me is that how many times do we have to reach this conclusion and how many ways do we have to write it down or sing it or inscribe it or communicate it to one another? It's almost like every single person who reads and writes a great deal is on a journey and that they all, if they keep on at a fair enthusiastic bound, reach the place where the sidewalk ends, 
the sheer cliff of insanity of tortured, dizzying heights, where we realize the gross excesses of language we have brought ourselves to, and the sublime irony of Samuel Beckett's words, quote, every word is like an unnecessary stain on silence and nothingness, end quote. Now, write that on your body a thousand times and drink a fifth of scotch whiskey and wait for Godot. Only really, really don't. So it's ironic that I know that words have driven me mad, but like a bug bite, I keep using words to scratch that itch, even knowing that it will make the matter worse. How many fruitless words have I expelled uselessly, painfully, fitfully through agonized insomnia and withdrawal from all reality except words until I can't do anything except breathe words in and out and any time spent away from words is like a blow upon a bruise or a storm washing me overboard and dragging me under. As much as I write, when it comes time to speak, too often I'm silent not because I have nothing to say but because I have too much to say and not enough sense of what will happen in response to anything I do choose to say of the many options and having had so many shockingly, surprisingly, alarmingly, traumatizingly bad things happen unexpectedly in response to things one would not think of as provoking or out of the blue until I'm painfully aware just how dangerous and vicious human beings are capable of being and how duplicitously calm they frequently appear on the surface while being so and how gratefully blind and quick stepped everyone else becomes while this is happening glad that it's not them that it's happening to and how fickle and backstabbing supporters can be when anything bad happens to me for exactly the same cowardly reason that it's not them that it's happening to words haven't changed this words haven't made this better words haven't even made this clearer to each other or ourselves or myself I can say these things to people and all people have to do is just deny, deny, derail, deny. I can say these things to people and all people have to do is just deny. And that's something people learn at the age of two. No! And refine all their lives with more and more syllables in order to make reality as comfortable around them as their privilege and influence and mental might can afford. Words haven't changed this either. It's been this way since we were children, both as a species and as individuals. And finally, from Leonard Cohen's song, Suzanne. There are heroes in the seaweed. There are children in the morning. They are leaning out for love, and they will lean that way forever, while Suzanne holds the mirror. And not just the words, but the melody. If you've never heard the song, go listen to it. He's not the only one who records it. It's, there's a cover by Peter Gabriel and one by Tori Amos. This, Lots of people have covered it. It's not the only scrap out there, I'll admit, but it's one of those snatches that I'll listen to over and over again, and it breaks my heart over and over when I hear it. it gives me that profound, almost painful melancholia. They used to be so revered when Saturn was a god that was worshipped, but these days is a mood that's medicated with SSRIs and SSNIs because we're supposed to be perversely, stepfordly happy all the time. That happiness is what we worship now. I feel like a medieval scholar looking at the moon and knowing I will never touch it. I feel like a writer writing the previous sentence and, and badly needing a better metaphor. It hurts my heart so much that it radiates down my arms and out my ring and middle fingers on each hand. 
I feel alexithymia, a word which means inability to express one's feelings in words. And I feel bastardized words, words as tools of abuse and weapons not easily beaten into even plowshares, much less the poetry of a soul, an expression of the ecstasies and agonies I've become so acquainted with, they perch all over the inside of my skin, occasionally throbbing out their sorrows and supernovas to disable me. At best, my sentiments come out as a smatteringly polite applause open my coffee night, unable to weave a cat's cradle in my fingertips and letters to delicately contain the enormity of feeling and experience that oozes and explodes. One of the things that this passage from Suzanne does to me is it hurts because I can still hear others' words that open me, that open my heart and my soul, where I feel things, I can read things, and it touches me deeply. I feel that communication that I desire to do with my words. I know that it's possible. I listen to Alexander Hamilton and I'm overcome and I see that other people are too. So I know that it's not that there isn't some string of words that could communicate. And part of the dark night of the soul for me is a sense that while passages like this fit inside me and open me like a key in an oiled lock that it was made for. I am an inept maker of keys for locks that have chewing gum stuffed in them, locks that don't fit, that I am too broken, that no matter how much I learn or try, but there's no way that I can ever overcome these things, that they're too fundamental, that I am too broken a communicator, whether it's through paranoia and defensiveness, through too many abusive conversations and abusive relationships and humiliations, too much heartache and trauma, too much time spent in my own head, too much neurotic self-analysis, too much time spent agonizing over my own failings, too little self-confidence, too much undermining at every step along the way of my own confidence, too many people too eager to poke holes in everything I say, to erase the words even as I set them down to challenge everything, but that I can hear words from other people that touch me in the way that I want to do and know that I have devoted my heart and soul to what saved me and sustained me as a child and that in my hours of greatest need and pain when I wanted to express that pain to other people, again and again, it's failed me. And sure, I can blame other people for not wanting to hear me. But in the end, there's also this terrible, terrible shame of knowing that part of it is that I'm not that good with words. I am not that good with words. And part of that is that I spent too much time trying to talk to people who didn't want to listen to me. There's no way to improve one's skill with words if one is talking to people exclusively who don't want to listen to you, who criticize everything you say and correct you and tell you that you're wrong. That's not how you build skill with something. 
you build skill and resilience with something when you have someone who encourages your good work, even if it's something that they don't particularly in themselves aesthetically enjoy, that they can recognize that it is powerful. Those are good teachers. And there are precious few of them. And being an autodidact and not liking myself very much means that I don't have that kind of a teacher. And I'm all too aware when I listen to Hamilton, when I listen to Leonard Cohen's lyrics, when I read a book that touches me deeply, that reflects something that touches me in a way that I would love to be able to use words to touch other people. I wish I was better with words. I think because, I don't know, investing my words, my time, my energy in making something, in curating myself and my words and my thoughts had in the past felt so much more rewarding and joyful. I never really had friends who valued the same things that I did. Even when I tried to make friends with other artists, they were so terribly insecure and competitive and catty and frankly, they brought their egos and shallowness rather than a very deep and abiding soulful need for this art, for this passion, this higher passion. Um, but that just ties back to the art and activism and why those two things overlapping appeal to me so much more than the two things separate. I do the best that I can, and I keep going, but I don't think it'll ever not hurt to hear some deeply, profoundly touching turn of phrase, particularly musical, because I couldn't write a song to save my life, and feel so inadequate, knowing that I would give anything to have that capacity to take, as the line goes and goes, to take all my emotions, all my hate, all my rage, all my passion, all my love, everything, ram it down into my gut, and then push it out my finger, not to flick a bottle cap with my ghostly, unearthly form into just the right words so that all of that emotion, all that rage and pain and hate and ecstasy and passion goes through that word, that through those words so that the majority of people who read them, who hear them, would be at least for a moment arrested enough to listen, to stop and hear, as if something really unusual, some never-before-smelled scent had wafted their way, overpowering them in their tracks, just long enough for them to pay attention, just long enough to get past that thick shell we all walk around with just long enough to have that chance that they could feel it too. I've fallen short of the only thing that I ever really tried so hard to do, even allowing for the fact that you can't please all the people all the time and that not everyone is going to want to hear what you have to say and that I can't base what I have to say on what other people want to hear 
because I tried that for a really long time. And that sucks. I can't base my self-expression on other people's comfort and desires. Because that's a quick way to become basically bait or codependent. And that's happened so often that it's made me even more brittle and paranoid and withdrawn and unable or perhaps unwilling to engage in two-way communication with other people, to even read comments or emails from other people. I know that, uh, that that doesn't help very much, but the times that I have tried, oh, and there are so many, many, many times that I have tried to come out of my shell have reminded me why I retreated into my shell in the first place and the second place and the third place and again and again. They remind me why I keep building these walls up again until I feel so lonely and isolated and quarantined and sick and defective that I tear them down and I reach out and try to make an honest connection with another human being. But I don't know how to do that without being who I am. And that leaves me unfortunately extremely vulnerable because of how different I am to everyone. No matter how hard I try, it's rare, if not impossible, to find someone who has the practice and the capacity to meet me halfway, to make the equal effort on their own part. I love words. I love them so much for what they've brought to me, all the gifts they've given me, the solace and the comfort that I haven't gotten from other people, the way that they've nurtured me and given me hope and validation where people have repeatedly failed me. And it's funny because they're the words of people, but they're curated, you know, words in art, words in books, words that people have taken the time to think about, to really honestly think on before they put them together. And there's that essence of consent where I seek out these words and I absorb them, but at any time I can say stop. And many times I have closed a book, stopped listening to something and put it away. But you can't do that in real time face to face with a person. I get along with art and with books so much better than people because those things have been as a result of real effort to communicate something of genuine meaning and feeling. Whereas most communication, most words are wasted on what we wish were true or hiding what's really true or static or bullshit, trying to convince ourselves and other people of things that isn't, that aren't true. Repeating things ad nauseum. So many words wasted. It reminds me of the line from V for Vendetta during the prolonged flashback where Valerie talks about the emerging totalitarian state where she says, I remember how the meaning of words began to change. And it made me think so much about politics, about things like the Clean Air Act and the Patriot Act, and how often in politics there are buzzwords, things that obscure the real meaning of what's going on. And it's the same in abusive relationships. Words like love used to uh, cover over what's really going on behind closed doors. And then in the advertising and commercials. Like the line from Roxanne, words are all used up. How can I use a word 
about you that someone uses about a floor wax? How can you love a laundry detergent <laughs> that we've almost abused and debased these words to a point where where we can't respond to them appropriately that we have to go to such extreme lengths to set ourselves up to repeat them over and over again to set the mood to surround the word with so much ritual and setup and, you know, mood lighting and candles and everything and all of this stuff, just so this one simple word expresses what it means for that person. And even then, the actions have to match with the word. But at the same time, how can I then read a book that's only words and that's all that there is? and be touched so deeply and moved so deeply and rather sit at home with a book than go out and talk to someone face to face. Well, for one thing, it's a lot safer. A book's not going to force it, me to hug it. I can close a book. If you say no to a person, sometimes they don't stop. Quite often they don't. Most of the time, the word no just starts an argument. And that's really scary to somebody who has no allies, no backup, and no resources, and has been targeted for violence a lot. But books have never followed me home and done things to me in my sleep. It's the thing about that I love about um, art, I guess, is the curated and thoughtful nature of it. The cultivated nature of it. Someone has taken time and thoughtfulness with it. And that conversations are so much more like reckless driving, often with blindfolds on. And yet we use the same language with both. Words have whipped me like barbed cat and nine tails. And I really know whereof I speak. When it comes to that metaphor, words have arrived with all the warmth of bricks thrown through windows in pre-printed government letters and vented spleens on the internet, having nothing to do with me and everything to do with the roving embittered, among which it is my misfortune to rove at times. Simple words don't do. They lie. They're easily misinterpreted and co-opted especially by the innocent and idiot and young and idealist, ringing false, barely scratched, too many words yawn with intellectual weariness. I can't seem to speak plainly, defensive, I suppose, out of sheer volume and frequency of a t antagonism of my life encounters. Cut me like a tree and thousands of rings of stormy bu verbal abuse you would see. No matter where I go for the crime of being honest, of saying no, of resisting, of being myself, when myself is a thing that is different, that has been struck repeatedly by more than you can imagine, by looking or even listening. Whatever I see, I defend preemptively and for some obvious reasons. That repels. I'm made aggressive by the haunting shadows of a lifetime of attacks. So wired up with triggers that at this point cutting any wire, pressing any button, is liable to level the landscape and populace around me. And the DSM-5 deigns to call this something like borderline personality disorder and PTSD and ignorant people who don't have to live with the results natter about medication like magpies as if medication rewrites an entire past or a personality in lifetime forged throughout decades or rewrites the future or replaces income and a failing body and memory and identity or changes capacities laid down while everyone else was having what most people think of as normal social and living experiences and I was all being brainwashed and having my body and soul violated in ways you can't imagine and I can't expressed to you using these faint words. 
words? There are infinite combinations. I spent so much of my life looking for the right string, as if it's some coding puzzle, but knowing frantically on some level that there is no right recipe, that people aren't computers because different people understand things differently. Everyone is running a different operating system. And in the end, I don't really understand me at all. As much as I see shards of me reflected here and there in this book, in this story, in this poem, in this, like glintings of mica on a gravel path, the mirror is broken and there is no true reflection in all of this world of who I am entire. There is no way to paint a picture in words of who I am. No single sentence or poem or word or story or novel that could express and explain myself, you see, because I'm not myself, you see. I am Alice through the shattered looking glass. There is no coming back. There is no back to come back to. Back is an illusion, a lie, and always was. The story is broken. Words ground to meaningless sand. The next video is about story. I only hope I can make it. Thank you for watching.